ET NCERT presents audio book introductory macroeconomics page 30 module 2.2 banking rationale bank is a financial institution and plays an important role for stimulating economic and social progress of a nation key concepts banking system credit creation money multiplier controls to money supply monetary policy page 31 2.2.1 banking system in order to understand money creation by banks let us discuss a story in the ancient city of surat people used gold and other precious metals in order to buy goods and services in other words these metals were acting as money mr manik chand was a goldsmith people in the town started keeping their gold with him for safe keeping in return for keeping their gold manik chand issued paper receipts to people of the town and charged a small fee from them slowly over time the paper receipts issued by mr manik chand began to circulate as money this means that instead of giving gold for purchasing wheat someone would pay for wheat or shoes or any other good by giving the paper receipts issued by manik chand note that the paper receipts started acting as money since everyone in the town accepted these as a medium of exchange now let us suppose that manik chand had 100 kgs of gold deposited by different people and he had issued receipts corresponding to 100 kgs of gold at this time sohan lal comes to manik chand and asks for a loan of 25 kgs of gold can manik chand give the loan the 100 kgs of gold with him already has claimants however manik chand could decide that everyone with gold deposits will not come to withdraw their deposits at the same time and so he may as well give the loan to sohan lal and charge him for it if mr manik chand gives the loan of 25 kgs of gold sohan lal could also pay ram lal with these 25 kgs of gold and ram lal could keep the 25 kgs of gold with manik chand in return for a paper receipt in effect the paper receipts acting as money would have risen to 125 kgs now it seems that mr manik chand has created money out of thin air mr manik chand behaved like the modern bank system banks are financial intermediaries which mediate between individuals or firms with excess funds and lend to those who need funds people with excess funds can keep their funds in the form of deposits in banks and those who need funds borrow funds in form of home loans crop loans etc why would anyone keep their excess funds in a bank people prefer to keep money in banks because banks offer to pay some interest on any deposits made also it may be safer to keep excess funds in a bank rather than at home in the modern context given checks and debit cards having a demand deposit makes transactions more convenient and safer even when they do not earn any interest imagine having to pay a large amount in cash for purchasing a house what does the bank do with the funds that have been deposited with it assuming that not everyone who has deposited funds with it will ask for their funds back at the same time the bank can loan these funds to someone who needs these funds at interest of course the bank has to be sure it will get the funds back at the required time so the bank will typically retain a portion of the funds to repay depositors when they demand their funds back and loan the rest since banks earn interest from loans they make any bank would like to lend the maximum possible however being able to repay depositors on demand is crucial to the bank's survival depositors would keep their funds in a bank only if they are fully confident 
of getting them back on demand. A bank must therefore balance its lending activities so as to ensure that sufficient funds are available to repay any depositor on demand. Page 32 2.2.2 Money creation by banking system Banks can create money in a manner similar to that as given in Manik Chand's story. Banks can lend simply because they do not expect all the depositors to withdraw what they have deposited at the same time. When the banks lend to any person, a new deposit is opened in that person's name. Thus, money supply increases to old deposits plus new deposit plus currency. Recall that capital M1 is equal to currency plus demand deposits. Let us take an example. Assume that there is only one bank in the country. Let us construct a fictional balance sheet for this bank. Balance sheet is a record of assets and liabilities of any firm. Conventionally, the assets of the firm are recorded on the left-hand side and liabilities on the right-hand side. Accounting rules say that both sides of the balance sheet must be equal or total assets must be equal to the total liabilities. Assets are things a firm owns or what a firm can claim from others. In case of a bank, apart from buildings, furniture, etc., its assets are loans given to public. When the bank gives out loan of rupees 100 to a person, this is the bank's claim on that person for rupees 100. Another asset that a bank has is reserves. Reserves are deposits which commercial banks keep with the central bank, Reserve Bank of India, that is RBI, and its cash. These reserves are kept partly as cash and partly in the form of financial instruments such as bonds and treasury bills, issued by the RBI. Reserves are similar to deposits we keep with banks. We keep deposits and these deposits are our assets. They can be withdrawn by us. Similarly, commercial banks like State Bank of India, SBI, keep their deposits with RBI and these are called reserves. Assets equals reserves plus loans. Liabilities for any firm are its debts or what it owes to others. For a bank, the main liability is the deposits which people keep with it. Liabilities equals deposits. The accounting rule states that both sides of the account must balance. Hence, if assets are greater than liabilities, they are recorded on the right-hand side as net worth. Net worth equals assets minus liabilities. Balance sheet of a fictional bank. Let our fictional bank start with deposits or liabilities equal to rupees 100. This could be because Miss Fernandez has deposited rupees 100 in the bank. Let this bank deposit the same amount with RBI as reserves. Table 2.2 represents its balance sheet. Page 33 Table 2.2 Balance Sheet of a Bank In this table, we have two columns and three rows. In the first column, we have information about assets. In the second column, we have information about liabilities. The first row tells us that the reserves with the bank are of rupees 100 and deposits are also of rupees 100. The second row tells us that the value of liabilities or the total net worth of liabilities is rupees 0. The third row tells us that the total assets of the bank are equal to rupees 100 and the total liabilities of the bank are also equal to rupees 100. If we assume that there is no currency in circulation, then the total money supply in the economy will be equal to rupees 100. M1 is equal to currency plus deposits, which is equal to 0 plus 100, which is equal to 100. 
2.2.3 Limits to Credit Creation and Money Multiplier Suppose Mr. Gupta comes to this bank for a loan of rupees 500. Can our bank give this loan? If it gives the loan and Mr. Gupta deposits the loan amount in the bank itself, the total bank deposits and therefore the total money supply will rise. It seems as though the banks can go on creating as much money as they want. But is there a limit to money or credit creation by banks? Yes, and this is determined by the central bank, that is the RBI. The RBI decides a certain percentage of deposits which every bank must keep as reserves. This is done to ensure that no bank is overlending. This is a legal requirement and is binding on the banks. This is called the required reserve ratio or the reserve ratio or cash reserve ratio indicated as capital CRR. Cash reserve ratio CRR equals percentage of deposits which a bank must keep as cash reserves with itself. Apart from the CRR, banks are also required to keep some reserves in liquid form in the short term. This ratio is called statutory liquidity ratio or SLR. In our fictional example, suppose CRR equals 20%. Then with deposits of rupees 100, our bank will need to keep rupees 20, which is 20% 20 of 100 as cash reserves. Only the remaining amount of deposits, that is rupees 80, which is 100 minus 20 equals 80, can be used to give loans. The statutory requirement of the reserve ratio acts as a limit to the amount of credit that banks can create. We can understand this by going back to our fictional example of an economy with one bank. Let us assume that our bank starts with a deposit of rupees 100 made by Leela. The reserve ratio is 20%. Thus, our bank has rupees 80, which is 100 minus 20, to lend, and the bank lends out rupees 80 to Sheila, which shows up in the bank's deposits in the next round as liabilities, making a total of rupees 180 as deposits. Now our bank is required to keep 20% of 180, that is, rupees 36 as cash reserves. Recall that our bank had started with rupees 100 as cash. Since it is required to keep only rupees 36 as reserves, it can lend rupees 64 again, which is 100 minus 36 equals 64. The bank lends out rupees 64 to Juned. This in turn shows up in the bank as deposits. The process keeps repeating itself till all the required reserves become rupees 100. The required reserves will be rupees 100 only when the total deposits become rupees 500. This is because for deposits of rupees 500, cash reserves would have to be rupees 100. 20% 20 of 500 is 100. The process is illustrated in Table 2.3. Page 34 Table 2.3 Money Multiplier Process this table has four columns. Column 1 indicates round. Column 2 indicates deposit in bank. Column 3 indicates required reserve. And column 4 indicates the loan made by the bank. There are several rows. However, the first two indicate values as does the last. The first row says that the deposit in the bank is 100. The required reserve, therefore, is 20. The loan made by the bank equals 80. The next row indicates that round 2 has the deposit in the bank as 180. The required reserve becomes 36 and the loan made by the bank is 64. When all of these are added up, column 2, the deposit in the bank is 500. Column 3, required reserve is 100. Column 4, loan made by the bank, is 400. The first column listed each round. 
The second column depicted the total deposits with the bank at the beginning of each round. 20% of these deposits needed to be deposited with the RBI as required reserves, which was in column 3. What the bank lends in each round gets added to the deposits with the bank in the next round. Column 4 indicated the loans made by the banks. Since the bank is only expected to keep 20% of its deposits as reserves, thus reserves of Rs 100, 20% of 500 equals 100, can support the deposits of Rs 500. In other words, our bank can give a loan of Rs 400. Table 2.4 demonstrates its balance sheet. Table 2.4 Balance Sheet of the Bank The table has two columns, the first indicating assets and the second liabilities. The first row indicates reserves of Rs 100 and deposits 100 plus 400 that is Rs 500. The second row indicates loans for Rs 400. The third row indicates the total assets as Rs 500 and the total liabilities as Rs 500. M1 equals currency plus deposits which equals 0 plus 500 which is equal to 500. Thus, money supply increases from Rs 100 to Rs 500. Given a CRR of 20%, the bank cannot give a loan beyond Rs 400. Hence, requirement of reserve acts as a limit to money creation. Money multiplier equals 1 upon cash reserve ratio. In our example, money multiplier equals 1 upon 20%, which equals 1 upon 0 0.2, which equals 5. Thus, reserves of Rs 100 create deposits of Rs 500, which is 5 into 100. Page 35 2.2.4 Policy Tools to Control Money Supply The RBI controls the money supply in the economy in various ways. The tools used by the central bank to control money supply can be quantitative or qualitative. These tools are illustrated in Figure 2.4. Quantitative tools control the extent of money supply by changing the CRR or bank rate or open market operations. Qualitative tools include persuasion by the central bank in order to make commercial banks discourage or encourage lending which is done through moral suasion, margin requirement and so on. Figure 2.4 Tools to control money supply From this diagram we can understand that tools to control money supply can be divided into two parts quantitative tools and qualitative tools. Quantitative tools can further be divided into three parts cash reserve ratio, bank rate and open market operations. Qualitative tools can further be divided into two parts moral suasion and margin requirement. It should be evident by now that if the central bank changes the reserve ratio, this would lead to changes in lending by the banks, which in turn would impact the deposits and hence the money supply. In the previously discussed example, what would the money multiplier be if the RBI increases the reserve ratio to 25%? Notice that in the previous case, rupees 100 in reserves could support deposits of rupees. 400 but the banking system would now be able to loan rupees 300 only it would have to call back some loans to meet the increased reserve requirements hence money supply would fall another important tool by which the rbi also influences money supply is open market operations open market operations refers to buying and selling of bonds issued by the government in the open market. This purchase and sale is entrusted to the central bank on behalf of the government. When RBI buys a government bond in the open market, it pays for it by giving a check. This check 
increases the total amount of reserves in the economy and thus increases the money supply. Selling of a bond by RBI to private individuals or institutions leads to reduction in quantity of reserves and hence the money supply. The RBI can influence money supply by changing the rate at which it gives loans to the commercial banks. This rate is called the bank rate in India. By increasing the bank rate, loans taken by commercial banks become more expensive. This reduces the reserves held by the commercial bank and hence decreases money supply. A fall in the bank rate can increase the money supply. Page 36 The impact of quantitative tools on money supply is summarized in Table 2.5. Table 2.5 Impact of Quantitative Tools on Money Supply Here we have a table with two columns and six rows. The first column tells us about the quantitative tools and the second column tells us about the impact on money supply. From the first row we infer that a rise in reserve ratio leads to a fall in money supply. From the second row we infer that a fall in reserve ratio leads to a rise in money supply. From the third row, we infer that purchasing of bonds leads to a rise in money supply. From the fourth row, we infer that sale of bonds leads to a fall in money supply. From the fifth row, we infer that a rise in bank rate may lead to a fall in money supply. From the sixth and last row, we infer that a fall in bank rate may lead to a rise in money supply. 2.2.5 Monetary Policy Monetary policy refers to an increase or decrease in the money supply by the government through the central bank. This is done through the central bank, through open operations, changes in reserve ratio and bank rate. The government often increases money supply in order to increase income or decrease rate of interest. This is called an expansionary monetary policy. In order to decrease income or raise interest rates, government may decrease money supply. This is called contractionary monetary policy. 2.2.6 Money Supply and Inflation Why doesn't the government increase money supply without any limits? Why should the government control money supply? One very important reason for this is that an increase in money supply leads to increase in the price levels, which in turn can lead to inflation. Page 37 Figure 2.5 Effect of increase in money supply Here we have a graph with two axes x and y. The x-axis represents quantity of money demanded and supplied. Quantity of money demanded is represented by md and quantity of money supplied is represented by ms. The y-axis represents price level which is represented by the letter p. From this diagram we can understand that as the price level rises from P0 to P1. Here, we can understand that as money supply increases from MS to MS1, the price level also increases from P0 to P1. When MS increases to MS1, the money market equilibrium occurs at point F. At this point, higher MD can only occur at a higher price level P1 so that equilibrium F is achieved. This is because if income and interest rate are fixed, money demand only increases when the price level rises. Another way of understanding this is by thinking of an economy which has a fixed output of one bag of wheat and total money supply of rupees 100, which can only be used to buy this bag of wheat. Then the price of this bag will be rupees 100. 
suppose money supply rises to rupees 150 now for the demand for money to equal rupees 150 the price of this bag must rise to rupees 150 so an increase in the supply of money has resulted in an increase in price the output remaining constant test your understanding 1 how can rbi help the commercial banks in a situation when all its depositors withdraw their deposits at the same time 2 calculate the total deposit created by the commercial banks if the required reserve ratio is 10% and primary deposit is rupees 1250 crores the answer is rupees 12500 crores module 2 ends here happy listening you were just listening to this chapter subject coordinator dr jaya singh production assistant jagbandhu jana sound recordist batilang lindo and vikas sangwan artists anandana kapoor and akash ahuja produced by vimlesh choudhury and presented by cie t n c e r t new delhi india